So we'll start with a little warm-up budget. I hope everybody knows. If you don't, just it'll be short. <laughs> Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Varadhari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Varadhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tirambana Chari Jamuna Tirambana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janabala Bhagiri Varadhari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tirambana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Varadhari Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, 
Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Premanandi Haribo. Thank you. Hare Krishna. I walked over the peak for you. Oh. <laughs> so I missed you. Hare Krishna. I believe there's already been an introduction to Kalakanta Prabhu. But I wanted to add something a little bit more. And I don't know what was said, so I'm sorry if it's a repeat, but repetition is good sometimes. Kalakanta Prabhu is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> and he's been serving Srila Prabhupada and Prabhupada's mission for something like 50 years. That's half a century. He's been a temple president in numerous places, in charge of temples. He has been uh, a college preacher. He's a published author. You can get some of his books on Amazon. He started a program in Alachua, University of Florida, Florida State. Which one is it? Go, 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 go Gators, as they say. Um, he started a college uh, outreach program with students that can live in a Krishna house and continue their schools. And it's taken off like a rocket. And he's expanded it. You're now in <clears throat> Houston, Ypsilanti, centers across America, and growing. So he's a very talented, sweet, humble, experienced devotee. He also has a wicked sense of humor. So watch out if you ask a question. No, no, he, he'll give you a good answer. So uh, we're very fortunate to have Kalakanta Prabhu with us tonight. Hare Krishna. Oh, there seems to be a, what do you call it, a... Anyway, uh, he's also, <clears throat> thank you very much, an initiating guru in ISKCON. So fill out your cards and sign up. <laughs> he passes out buttons. You know. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Very nice to be here after 20 years, actually. Uh, anyone here for the first time tonight? Welcome. Thank you for coming. So we are preparing to celebrate a big holiday, and I'm going to read a little about it in a moment, but uh, just since you're here for the first time, just to let you know it's Krishna's birthday this week. So this is Krishna on the altar in the center, on our left, with Radharani, his wonderful devotional energy personified. And Krishna appeared uh, 5,000 years ago in Vrindavan, India, where uh, he began an incredible life of instruction and example in spirituality. So his book, the Bhagavad Gita, has been studied for thousands of years as the most essential, concise, and powerful treatise on spiritual advancement. Uh, Krishna has incredible activities which are described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the great classics of India, Sanskrit. And the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam were translated and brought to the West by our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, who's here on the honored seat here on my left. Srila Prabhupada arrived in, in uh, America in 1965 at the age of 70 and uh, with starting from nothing, began this incredible worldwide international Krishna consciousness movement. Uh, Krishna has become famous all over the world thanks to Srila Prabhupada. So again, this Friday, Friday, it will be celebrating his birthday with uh, wonderful festivities here at the temple. And I'm going to give a little appetizer for that celebration tonight by reading something about Krishna's birth. 
Uh, before I start, I wanted to ask, how many of you uh, have ever heard of a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Some of you know, okay. So, in that book, the, the bad guy is notorious for capturing and tying up his enemies and reading poetry to them. Do you remember that? <laughs> so, to, in honor of Krishna's birthday, I'm going to read some poetry to you tonight, and I thank you very much for coming. Make sure the doors are locked, please. <laughs> the Srimad Bhagavatam describes Krishna's appearance, and it's a, a very complex and mystical appearance. So those of you who are experienced in Krishna consciousness, you're familiar with these stories, uh, these pastimes which are related in the original Sanskrit. And as a um, study exercise some years ago, I went through them verse by verse and put them into an English form that as closely as possible mirrors the original in the Sanskrit. So what I'm going to read to you now is a poetic version of Krishna's birth. Uh, since it's plagiarized from Srimad Bhagavatam, we'll start with a little invocation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya The advent of Lord Krishna begins with the story of the earth being in a great state of distress, something we can all relate to. In our Vedic tradition, there is a person behind everything. So there is also a, a goddess of earth uh, who is feeling the burden of unnecessary and excessive buildup of military forces around the world. So bearing this weight, she went to petition the senior god in the universe, Brahma, for help. He, in turn, took the earth to Lord Vishnu, the fountainhead of existence of the entire material creation. So when Brahma asked Vishnu about the situation, he said, yes, I'm well aware. Earth is in distress, but don't worry. Krishna himself will be coming. And uh, now he instructed all of you you senior gods in this universe, you go and take birth on the earth planet so you can be part of Krishna's family and entourage. So this is how the, the story begins. So Krishna's family next uh, is, is described and some of the drama surrounding his birth. Krishna's mother was named Devaki and on her wedding day we pick up the story. In honor of her marriage, Kamsa's son of Ugrasen took up his sister Devaki's fine chariot and reins. With Vasudev, her husband, at her side, the royal maid prepared to ride with Kamsa in her wedding day parade. So we have Devaki, her brother Kamsa, and her husband Vasudev. They've been married, now they're going in a large procession. Kamsa is driving the chariot. Her dowry featured elephants with garlands made of gold. 400 soldiers riding golden chariots patrolled, 200 lovely bridesmaids, 15,000 jeweled steeds with pride, all tried to please the bride and satisfy her needs. Sweet music filled the air as Kamsa drove the bride and groom. Then suddenly, an unembodied voice proclaimed his doom. You foolish Kamsa, though today you serve this man and wife, the eighth child born to Devaki will someday take your life. The wicked Kamsa turned to Devaki with shock and dread. His sword in hand, he snatched her hair and roared, Off with her head! The tactful Vasudev saw this and, holding Kamsa's arm, addressed his angry in-law without showing his alarm. You are your family's pride, dear Kamsa. Heroes sing your praise. How could someone as great as you behave in such a way? To kill a girl, indeed your sister, on her wedding day will surely stain your reputation. What will people say? Now think this through, great hero. From the moment of your birth, your body inexorably returns back into earth. By one means or another, be it now or decades hence, your death is surely coming. It is simply common sense. 
So Vasudeva attempts to address the situation with the perennial philosophy of the soul as distinct from the body. And when your body turns to dust, your soul again acquires another earthly body formed to suit your own desires. As when you walk, you shift your weight from back foot to the fore, you'll change your body after death and leave the one before. As one asleep is certain that the life he dreams is real, the soul believes in everything the body does or feels. The fleeting artificial body keeps the soul engaged while making him forget that he is living in a cage. As wind distorts reflections of the moon upon a lake, illusion makes the spirit think, I'm flesh, a big mistake. Since sinful actions cause the soul to stay in this condition, why not consider carefully and then make your decision? Your younger sister Devaki is like your very child. She so deserves your loving shelter. Please be reconciled, for you are very merciful. Do not cut off her head, but give her love and treat her as a father would instead. So in response to this prophecy that he's going to be killed by his sister's eighth child, Vasudev, her husband, says, look, you're going to die anyway. You're not this body. And what's the big deal? And how are you going to dare commit this horrible sin of killing your sister? Of course, this made absolutely no impact on Kamsa whatsoever. <laughs> Because of his demonic nature, Kamsa felt disdain about the tax for sinful acts that Vasudev explained. As Vasudev saw Kamsa pulling back his sister's head, he came up with another plan. Within himself, he said, when circumstances threaten one's existence or one's wife, one must use any method to avoid the loss of life. Perhaps he will die first. So if I promise now to give my future sons to Kamsa, at least Devaki may live. The anxious Vasudev knew well what panic might invoke, so with respect he smiled at Kamsa, cleared his throat, and spoke. Great soul, why are you frightened by an unembodied voice? Your sister will not harm you, just perhaps her future boys. You have my word, dear brother. When your sister bears our sons, I promise to bring each to you to do what must be done. Although he was atrocious, when he heard these gentle words, cruel Kamsa put his sword away, completely reassured. He fully trusted Vasudev, whose character was such that Kamsa knew he'd keep his word, although he'd pledged so much. So he said, I, uh, don't worry, I'll bring all of our sons to you. When Devaki was f f freed by Kamsa, in due time she bore a shining baby boy whom any parent would adore. Her husband took the boy away, for though he loved his son, he would not lie to Kamsa, nor indeed to anyone. When Kamsa saw that Vasudev had brought the newborn child exactly as he promised, he examined him and smiled. Take back your son, dear Vasudev, said Kamsa with good cheer. The omen said your eighth child is the one that I must fear. Returning with the baby boy, wise Vasudev perceived that Kamsa was impulsive and could never be believed. Now at that time, Saint Narada, the ever-roaming sage, decided to speed Krishna's birth by prompting Kamsa's rage. So this is rather an amazing part of this pastime. How Kamsa has, okay, I'm going to spare this child. But Narada, the great kindly-hearted Vaishnava, uh, devotee of Krishna, comes on the scene, as he does in every canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. <laughs> and for an inexplicable reason, decides to agitate the situation. <laughs> Actually, he had a reason. And what was his reason? <laughs> he wanted Krishna to come as soon as possible. <laughs> so he said to Kamsa, Said Narada to Kamsa, Sir, have you been made aware the gods are here as Yadus and surround you everywhere? Their presence in your neighborhood should lead you to assess that Vishnu will be coming soon to ease the earth's distress. The words of Narada left Kamsa thoroughly provoked and made him tremble angrily. Again, the mystic spoke. 
In your last life, you also practiced wickedness and sin. Lord Krishna killed you then, and now it seems he will again. So Narada the prophet could see past, present, and future, and he recognized in the past life, Kamsa was also killed by Vishnu. And now he's saying, it's going to happen again. Hmm. The words of Narada left Kamsa thoroughly provoked and made him tremble angrily. As Narada departed, Kamsa fumed and set his mind. Just see, he thought, what happens when a man tries to be kind? He killed Devaki's baby and, along with Ugrasen, put her and Vasudev in jail and hailed his new domain. So this was how he responded. Ah, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to go easily. So he, he put his father in prison. The father was, was the king, Ugrasen. Devaki and Kamsa were his children. He staged a coup, put his father in jail, put his sister and her husband in jail. Now Vasudev and Devaki could see their only hope would come as the eighth child foretold in Kamsa's horoscope. Thus suffering in prison after kill, Kamsa killed their boy, each year they bore another child for Kamsa to destroy. So sometimes people ask, if Kamsa didn't want this eighth child born, why didn't he just keep them separate? But Kamsa was also you know, of the same mind. I want to get this over with as soon as possible. And Devaki and Vasudev, why did, why did they continue having children? Because they wanted to get it over as soon as possible. Too. So there's a whole backstory about these children. That's, that's another, an, a, another uh, pastime. But here they are in jail. Can, you can imagine the horror of it. They are just conceiving children one after the next, only to have them killed by this wicked uh, despot, Kamsa. As Kamsa gathered power, he was nearly unopposed, for many other demons helped him terrorize his foes. He killed six sons of Devaki. The Yadus fled in fear, except for some who stayed and prayed for Krishna to appear. Her seventh pregnancy brought Devaki both joy and gloom. She didn't know the Lord's expansion lived within her womb. Lord Krishna elsewhere summoned Yoga Maya to request that she protect his devotees through these clandestine steps. So here the plot becomes a little complex. But Krishna called his illusory energy Yoga Maya and said, look, here's what I want you to do. You go up here in the home of Nanda Maharaj across the river <coughs> and, uh, and I will come here in Devaki's womb. Essentially, this is what he said in a simple way. So, when Devaki, uh, Devaki had a miscarriage, which was another part of the past I won't go into. When Devaki miscarried Balaram, the people said, since Kamsa killed her children, she aborted it instead. So her seventh pregnancy externally ended in a miscarriage. At that time, Krishna, God himself, who vanquishes all fear, went in the mind of Vasudev and ready to appear. While burying Krishna, Vasudev appeared just like the sun, so his glow so bright the shining light astonished everyone. When he placed Krishna in the mind of Devaki one day, her visage bloomed, a waxing moon on opulent display. To, hear, to bear the Lord while trapped in jail by Kamsa's wicked plot made Devaki seem like a fire kept within a pot, or like a man enlightened, wise, and thoroughly refined who fails to share his wisdom for the good of humankind. As Devaki grew jubilant, King Kamsa grew concerned. This Vishnu killed me once, he thought, and now he has returned to kill me once again. Yet killing Devaki today will only bring me trouble in a different sort of way. To kill a pregnant relative would cost me all respect. My opulence would vanish and my subjects would defect. My health and life and legacy would all die out as well. A wicked man is just a corpse descending into hell. Deliberating in this way, King Kamsa chose to wait to let the child be born and then administer its fate. While on his throne or in his bed, King Kamsa stayed absorbed in thoughts about his enemy, the all-pervading Lord. So ours is a society for Krishna consciousness. And we want to think of Krishna in a favorable, friendly, and loving way. But this Kamsa was also thinking of Krishna, but 
how he was going to get rid of him. <laughs> so then the demigods all come to worship and to encourage Devaki in her pregnancy. And finally, Lord Krishna appears. It's complicated, isn't it? <laughs> One pleasant evening, earth seemed bathed in happiness and love. The sacred constellation Rohini appeared above with other stars and planets twinkling in the cloudless sky. The universe itself seemed pleasing, still, and satisfying. The moonlit Mother Earth displayed her pastures, mines, and towns. In fragrant trees, the birds and bees sang out their pleasing sounds. The rivers poured clear water into reservoirs and lakes where lotuses and lilies bloomed, appearing wide awake. The Brahmins rose before the dawn, took bath, and set alight their sacrificial fires in accord with Vedic rites. Across the lakes and pastures, silky fragrant breezes came. They pleased the Brahmins tending fires, but didn't spoil the flames. The Brahmins, who had suffered much from Kamsa and his men, began to feel tranquility, pervade their hearts again. The higher worlds resounded with the sons of kettle drums as gods peered down at earth, expecting Krishna soon would come. While gods threw flowers, danced and sang in heavenly enclaves, assembling clouds made thundering sounds like gentle ocean waves. So the whole environment became beautiful, peaceful, ideal. The priests were happy. The, the climate was like San Diego. <laughs> then Vishnu, he who dwells within the hearts of you and me, appeared as if a full moon from the heart of Devaki. In his four hands, the child had lotus, chakra, uh, conch, and club. His bangled arms and jeweled ears and helmet placed above his scattered hair set off his yellow silks and blue-black skin. And there around his neck was hung the famed Kaustuba gem. So I'd mentioned earlier, Vishnu is the magnificent, awesome uh, uh, fountainhead of the creation. He is worshipped with great majesty in his four-armed form. Uh, and, and this is a form in which he chose to appear to his parents for reasons which will become apparent soon. As Vasudev beheld his child, he thought his eyes had failed. How could the Lord, so nicely dressed, be born inside a jail? The father could not celebrate, though he was much inclined, so he gave out 10,000 cows within his joyous mind. On seeing how the child's effulgence lit the dismal cell, the awestruck Vasudev felt peace, his worries all dispelled. He joined his palms and bowed his head, and then, though it seemed strange, began with wife and newborn son the following exchange. Now, in this beautiful Sanskrit poetry of the Bhagavatam, the, the rhythm, the meter of the verses will change according to who's speaking. Sometimes they'll be changed. So this is one occasion. So here's the father... He, his newborn son, who is the awesome form of God, <laughs> Vishnu, uh, but yet he's th going to speak very simply to the newborn. So the meter gets a little simpler. It goes like this. Primeval, transcendent, ubiquitous Lord, I see your position as never before. You made the creation, and yet as its God, you're here as our son by your own sweet facade. Your powers create everything that we see, yet they are distinct and complete potencies. You too are distinct from this world you have made, yet my confused eyes see you clearly today. My Lord, you're adored in the finest of rooms. Why come in a jail through a prisoner's womb? O master of all, I can safely presume, since you have arrived, cruel Kamsa is doomed. So dad is thinking in this way. Now, there are different relationships one can have with God, and they start with this awe and reverence, but they progress into higher, more intimate relationships, such as f servant, friend, and even parent. So Vasudev is a little mixed between being a parent and being in awe of his son, <laughs> but he's, he's recognizing his divinity. Now Devaki also wants to speak to her newborn son, and she too is a little confused. <laughs> Am I, is this God or is this my baby? 
Dear Almighty Lord, now at last you have come within your creation as bright as the sun. The Vedas exalt you and all you arrange. No one can divorce you or force you to change. The common man longs for the heavenly skies and freedom from illness, old age, and demise. But when you appear, death itself runs away and we all feel peaceful, no longer afraid. As Kamsa still persecutes, good people please defeat all the fears of sincere devotees and cover this form much adored by the wise from envious evil material eyes. Your four-handed form doesn't fit in this world. I should have a two-handed boy or a girl. No one will think Vishnu could come from my womb. Please change and I'll hide you. The guards will come soon. <laughs> <laughs> so then Vishnu, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-pervading personality of Godhead, speaks like a child to his parents, like a little baby, and the meter gets even simpler. <laughs> My dear mother, now please be blessed. Among chaste women you are the best. Let me now put your mind at rest. Let your heart fill with happiness. Long ago, in a former life, you were still Vasudeva's wife. Though Brahma said to procreate, you first sat down to meditate. Both of you sat through heat and cold, hearts made perfect by self-control. I was pleased, so I asked you to say what you wanted me to do. All you wanted, you said humbly, was the boon of a son like me. Twice I came as your son back then. Here today I have come again. Had I come as a normal boy, would your faith have been unalloyed? Still I'm yours, and since you love me, when you die you will come to me. So he says, uh, this is why I appeared in my majestic form, just so you'd know who you're dealing with. <laughs> but since you want, I'll change into a, the form of an ordinary boy, child. Lord Vishnu then fell silent, and before his parents' eyes, his figure changed from Vishnu to a child of normal size. Reclining in his legendary transcendental form, he showed himself as baby Krishna, smiling bright and warm. Then Yogamaya took her birth, just as Lord Krishna planned, across the river Jamuna in Nanda's rural land. When Yashoda, King Nanda's wife, gave birth that mystic night, exhausted from her labor, she slept on, her eyes shut tight. By Yogamaya's influence, the guards in Kamsa's jail, not hearing sounds of childbirth, not a whimper, sob, or wail, fell fast asleep as well and could not see or hear a sound. At this, the gates swung open, and their locks fell to the ground. When thundering clouds let out their rain as gently as they could, a mystic serpent sheltered man and son with many hoods. As Vasudev, the huge white snake and babe of blackish blue, snuck quickly past the sleeping guards, King Kamsa slept on too. The swirling river Jamuna, made deeper by the showers, came to a halt and made a path by Yogamaya's powers. The river welcomed Vasudev, lest Krishna should be lost, just as the Indian Ocean once allowed Lord Ram to cross. When Vasudev reached Nanda's house, where everybody slept, he found the room of Yashoda and pondered his next step. So here he is, he's snuck out of the jail, he's got his baby, he's being protected by this mystical snake. And now he's come to Yashoda, who's asleep with her newborn baby. Now what is he going to do? In hopes that even Kamsa would not kill a newborn daughter, he switched the babes and ran at once back through the swirling waters. Back past the sleeping guards, he slipped through every open door. He chained himself and Devaki in shackles as before. He placed the girl by Devaki, who looked at her and smiled. While Yashoda, asleep, knew not the gender of her child. So this is how Krishna appears, complicated. <laughs> uh, but he has reasons for all of these amazing, these amazing pastimes. So there, Jashoda has Krishna as a foster son in the rural lands across the river. And back in jail, Devaki has this mystic daughter 
who's about to scare the to scare the dhoti off Kamsa. <laughs> All right, so that's a little uh, warm up for this this week's Janmashtami festival. I hope that stirs your desire to come and take part in the festivities of Krishna's birth. <laughs> so I'll stop there. If there's uh, any comments now, any reflections, questions about Krishna, questions about Krishna consciousness? Maharaj. If no one else has a question. Please. I have a general question. People say, well, what's the cause of Krishna? And we say Krishna is Ishwara Paramakrishna. He's the cause of all causes. He has no cause. And that's just the nature of Krishna's being. He's the source of all things. All right, then. Then why can't the materialist say... Well, material nature, we don't need a source, God, everything emanates from him. The material nature, just as Krishna has always existed, the material nature has always existed. It just is. It's going on by natural laws of physics, and it just is. Why do you need to, you know, invent a creator to give yourself a sense of purpose to the universe? Mm -hmm. Yes, as especially one who would appear in such a convoluted way. <laughs> right, this, this is the, a fundamental question between theism and a, atheism, is it? isn't it? If, if uh, nature is there, why do we need to imagine or create a god? We can just study nature and get to the ultimate truth of reality. So the talk that Vasudev had with Kamsa earlier in the chapter. Uh, when he was telling Kamsa, you're not this body. Like you're, you've heard this prophecy, you're going to die, but you're going to die anyway. Uh, th because the body itself is made of these very physical elements that you're describing. <laughs> so th the body is made of these physical elements. Uh, and if all we are is this bag of elements, then what is the need of morality? What is the need of anything but uh, ameliorating our physical desires. Uh, and this is not a human life, it's an animal life. The, uh, the human has the brain power to understand that there is something besides the physical body, the, the body of this material universe. There's something beside that because we have this innate desire to want to live forever. If we're just a physical body that's going to die, where does that come from? Uh, so the, the beginning of spiritual life is understanding that we are not this physical body. As such, we have to consider what is our next lifetime, because if we're going to go from one body to another body. So for the person who's only interested in the physical, getting as much joy as they can while they can, uh, they have their path for happiness. I'm from Florida, and you know, go down to South Florida and Miami Beach, and you will see people of mature years showing parts of their physical bodies you really wish they wouldn't show, uh, trying to relive the joys of their youth. As one of my friends calls it the world's largest changing bodies exhibition. <laughs> uh, and it shows the result of a life trying to enjoy the body. The spiritualist thinks ahead. Okay, since I am an eternal spirit, what's going to happen in my next life? So this is the essential uh, conflict between the theist and the atheist, between the yogi and the materialist. Uh, and the, the, there was a great theist named Pascal years ago who was having this discussion with an atheistic friend. So he said, look, my friend, you're trying to enjoy this physical world. Uh, and are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Okay, and as for me, I'm reflective, I'm seeing things from a spiritual perspective. I'm also happy. So if you're right, 
and there's no next life, we're equal. You're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> but if I'm right, and we get the results of our present actions in our next life, I'm going to be ready, but you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> this is called Pascal's wager. You have nothing to lose by understanding a higher power. You have nothing to lose because a spiritual life is actually much happier. You know, it's just like if you are in college and you know you have a final exam on Monday, right? And it's Friday. So you have two choices. You can study and get prepared for the exam, and then you might have some free time Saturday, Sunday to enjoy yourself. Or you can go out Friday night and go out Saturday night and party and think, you know, I'll, I'll study Sunday. But on that Friday and Saturday night, what are you thinking? The whole time you know I've got an exam coming up. <laughs> so a spiritualist is one who just gets ready for the exam before it comes. Then you can actually enjoy without anxiety. <laughs> So this is yoga, the to, to be prepared uh, with spiritual knowledge before this body gives up on us. Uh, and that is a wonderful, joyous feeling that is the gift Srila Prabhupada has given us through this bhakti yoga, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. I hope that answers your question, Maharaj. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Thank you, Kalakanta. That's a great explanation. <laughs> I think it's appropriate because we have a lot of newcomers to equate in your best realization the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra being mm. non-different from Krishna that you so nicely, poetically, gave us a description of his appearance, which is this Friday. Um, how is the holy name, how is the sound vibration the same as him? <laughs> Wonderful question. In the physical sense, if we say the name of something, it's not the same as the thing itself. For example, we may be thirsty. We say, water, 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 but it won't quench our thirst. But in the spiritual dimension, everything is absolute. Therefore, the name of something is non-different from the thing it represents. You know, Plato had his world of, uh, world of things and world of ideas. The world of things are temporary, like a chair itself is temporary, but the concept of a chair is eternal. So, similarly, in the spiritual sense, everything is absolute. Uh, so, this creator, the origin of everything, has a name. His name is Krishna, or Allah, or Buddha, Jehovah, or what have you, as you, you like. <clears throat> and that name is absolute. And th there is no difference between the thing, or the person, and the name. I am... 3,000 or 2,000 miles away from my wife today. <laughs> so, and she's having a great time, I'm sure. But the, uh, <laughs> to say my wife's name is not the same as being in her company. Right? So, Krishna, on the other hand, if we say his name, because there's no difference, we are immediately with Krishna. He's that accessible. And the quality of Krishna's absolute nature can be subjectively experienced through repetition of his name. It's very simple. It is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, which simply means, my dear, all-powerful Lord, please let me serve you, please let me love you, please let me connect with you. Uh, uh, this sound vibration is such that if we chant it, we won't, it's never tiring. That's how we can tell it's different. Uh, once a gentleman asked Srila Prabhupada, why chant Hare Krishna, why not chant Coca-Cola? And Prabhupada said, chant Coca-Cola. And when you get tired, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> As Maharaj mentioned, some of us have been chanting this Hare Krishna mantra for decades. It gets sweeter and it doesn't get tiring. Uh, it, it invokes a, a desire and a taste to chant even more. Uh, so it's free. It makes you high. It's legal. <laughs> uh, what's not to like? No hangover. No hangover. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Prabhu. That's an awesome answer. This is my 
poetic guru, Dravida Prabhu? I am in awe of the poem, which I, <laughs> it would take me about five years to write something like that. <laughs> but uh, I have a question that um, I remember when first reading this many, many years ago. Uh, I was struck with two, um, how shall I put it, apparent uh, ethical contradictions. And the first one is uh, Narada Muni. You know, Vasudev had, had, had done his thing, and it was working, and the boys, the six boys could have grown up, in the, even in the, if they'd grown up in the prison house, I mean, they, they would have been alive. <laughs> but he goes and he tells, no, 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 the demigods have taken all their birth, you have to be careful. So, how do we, uh, and, and then the other one is, because this is Vasudev, his whole, his, the whole reason why he was able to convince Kamsa was because he was known for being absolutely truthful. And yet, and then when it finally came down to it, he didn't deliver that eighth child. And then he, you know, he brought Maya, uh, the yoga Maya back, who was in the form of a little ch child. And did he really know that she wasn't going to get smashed against, <laughs> against the floor <laughs> like the others? So, so how do we reconcile these seemingly uh, breaks in ordinary morality? I think you, you missed your calling, Prabhu. You should have been an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> So as I, I mentioned earlier, Narada's appearance is completely mystifying. Uh, but he had this purpose of wanting to accelerate Krishna's appearance. The sooner uh, Kamsa could be dealt with, the better for all concerned. So it really was out of his compassion uh, for the people, out of his desire, his eagerness to see the Supreme Lord, uh, and his knowledge that none of this would be happening without Krishna's arrangement. So he had, th this is really important for theists to understand that nothing happens without God's intercession, even the ugly things, even the difficult things. They're happening for a reason. And uh, knowing that is a great source of comfort, even if we're upset or agitated by events. It, well, it's happening, but Krishna has some reason. I don't know it now, I can't see it now, I wish it weren't happening, but I do have faith that it's going to be evident in time, as it was in this case. Now, your, your point about Vasudev is very uh, intriguing. In other words, he went and switched his kid for the other uh, kid and then brought that girl back to be killed by Kamps. He didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know who, uh, what Kamps would be dealing with. <laughs> He breaks his promise. And then he dooms this little baby. <laughs> well, <laughs> so what, where's, the, where's the moral boss today? Okay, now, um, your honor. <laughs> May it please the court. <laughs> uh, yes. This is one point. He, he thought, okay, thinking, yes, it's, he's as wicked as he is, he wouldn't kill a little girl because he had nothing to fear from a little girl, a big, strong man like him. That was one, one uh, mitigating factor. Um, another is that he was acting, <clears throat> uh, as far as breaking his promise, he, how was he breaking his promise? The eighth child was going to be there. He was just hoping to uh, give a, an eighth child that Kamsa wouldn't kill, wouldn't feel threatened by. <laughs> May it please the court. Uh, <laughs> uh, but most of all, all of this is being orchestrated by Krishna for reasons that ultimately glorify his servants. How they maintained their faith in all of these difficulties, how they were unshaken in their determination to serve him and carry out his will. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, that he explains that he's sitting in everyone's heart, sarvasya chaham hridi sanavishto, and he's giving mataks matir gyanam apohanam cha, he's giving knowledge and remembrance, he's guiding the wanderings of us all. So he was ultimately guiding 
his servant Vasudev to do these things. Okay? Is that satisfactory? <laughs> In the Gita. Okay. You had your shot. I'm, all, I'm sure I'll hear about this later. Anyway, good. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Are you, Hi. Are you new here? Or have you been well, I've been here before. Huh. So I was taught by Uddhava Dasi, a student of Siddha Swarupananda Swami Prabhupada. Mm. And I trained under her for about a year, giving oh. up all of my possessions inside of a meditation center, which she opened in Carmichael, California. Okay. My question is in regards to the term yo-yo yogi, and this was a term that she used often. Okay. And I wondered why, but I think that it's something that I would like to ask you about now. Okay, but so. I, I will need an explanation about what is a yo-yo yogi. Okay, so <laughs> often I would pour my entire life into Krishna consciousness and do the 16 rounds per day, uh -huh. read scripture each day, listen to the talk of the spiritual master each day, and the kirtan. Uh -huh. And it becomes sometimes very overwhelming working in the material world, especially with a child. Mm -hmm. And I went through a divorce after I was physically abused and beaten by my previous partner. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. I'm grateful now to be here in San Diego again in a safe space with a wonderful man mm -hmm. who is helping me raise my daughter very nice and i feel very blessed by krishna mm. working six days a week with my daughter is very difficult to perform mm. the 16 rounds per day i see that's what you mean by yo yo yogi yes yeah, so Back sometimes i can do the 16 rounds right. but other days it may be very overwhelming and a lot on my plate mm -hmm. so what would you recommend in order to still stay rooted in krishna consciousness very good question it's a very relevant question for us all um, <clears throat> there's several things to consider. First, <clears throat> excuse me, um, ch chanting Hare Krishna is, is the simplest way to be a yogi and to meditate and awaken the heart with love of God. And you've experienced that. Mm -hmm. So how much should you chant? Well, how much ha can you chant? There's a, 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 in, in the elaborate service of the deities, there's a, a saying that the highest standard is one you can maintain nicely. Mm -hmm. So if you can chant at a certain level, given your circumstances, whether it's one round a day or four rounds a day, 16 is a lot. Mm -hmm. 16 is good when you're a single person living in an ashram. Mm -hmm. uh, 16 is good when you're practiced and accustomed to r going to bed with at an early hour and rising at an early hour and having those peaceful hours maybe before the day starts to meditate and pray. Mm -hmm. you know, 16 rounds can be done, but it has to be something that is manageable in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, feeling guilty is not a way to love God. We can't love God out of guilt. We can love God out of desire to please Him and, and uh, to connect with Him, you see? Mm -hmm. so, Krishna is uh, called Bhava Grahi Janardana. He knows the heart of the devotee. So if your desire is there to connect with Krishna, but your circumstances inhibit it, you're like Devaki and Vasudeva in a way. You're, mm -hmm. you're in a situation that doesn't allow for full expression. That's okay. And raising a child, especially a child in spiritual consciousness, is a great service to the world. So you're, you're making an offering uh, of your life and your service even though you may not be able to chant as much as you could in the ashram. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Thank you. Marsh, can you add to that? Your answer was expert. Excellent. Yes. And very compassionate. I just wanted to add a quick statement by Srila Prabhupada. There's a morning walk, and it's recorded. Prabhupada's walking in Venice Beach. And uh, one saffron cloth sannyasi, a senior monk, had a little bit of a rock in his shoe or something. I don't know what was his issue. But he was saying to Srila Prabhupada, you know, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement, was saying that, you know, these mothers, we don't see them at the first 430 Mangalarti. We don't see them doing so much savor service at the temple. We, uh, some of them don't even chant 16 rounds. They spend their whole time taking care of their children. Prabhupada stopped him. 
And he, Prabhupada said, you're just envious. <laughs> he said, because no one will marry you, you're mad at the women. <laughs> it's pretty far. I was joking, but he was actually making a solid point. And then he said, you don't worry about the women. Prabhupada said, they have their service taking care of their children. He said, you don't worry. Krishna takes personal care of the mothers. Mm. So you can know that you just take good care of your child, try to make her Krishna conscious, and Krishna will take personal care of you. Just along the lines Kalakanta said. Oh. Oh. <laughs> don't worry. All right. Feels like it should be Mother's Day instead of John Mastami. It's just like, it's move. <laughs> All right, any last questions, comments? Okay, you by Kunta Prabhu. As Bhajan Ryan Maharaj mentioned, so much of your outreach is in college environments and students actually moving into Krishna ashrams. So how does that work out? They're, they're finishing their college, which is one whole system of knowledge, and mm -hmm. then they're studying this whole Krishna system of knowledge, which sometimes uh -huh. we almost see as seemingly somewhat opposed. So just curious. Let's, let's hear directly from the authority on this. Uh, my, my companion here, Nittai Prasad Prabhu, he is studying at University of Florida doing his PhD in chemistry, and uh, actually his parents are both disciples of Sarup Damodar Goswami. So Nittai, you are studying and you are maintaining a nice sadhana in the ashram. How do you reconcile this material knowledge and your spiritual advancement? Well. <laughs> <laughs> in so, 50 words or less. Yeah. <laughs> For me, like, uh, I, uh, everyone who stays at the Krishna house is committed to attend the morning program, which is from which is shorter version of the, like the morning programs we have at other temples, it's from six to eight thirty. So, our inspiration is when we wake up and like attend the morning program with other other devotees and listen to spiritual like discourse and chant our rounds and meditate. We are properly prepared to go out into the day to do our work and still be like protected from like un all the negative influences that could affect us. And so for me, like, so that's why like during the spiritual practice in the morning, like, and then the rest of the day, I'm just happy. Like I'm happy to do my work as a service to Krishna because uh, I could use also the material education in service of Krishna. I have like some faith that like once I have a degree, I can use that in service of Krishna so that it's not like I'm separating my work life and my spiritual life, like putting them in different spheres, but I know it's all like with a desire that I can use that to serve Krishna. So spiritual education and the material education, that's how it comes together, like having that understanding and living at Krishna house in an ashram setting. It's, it's very helpful because we have a lot of like uh, people who go to grad school, like a lot of the problems they have is has to do with loneliness because they move to a different city, to a different college. They're doing the works, but they're not well connected with the peers. But staying at an ashram, we have friends. Like we go out to work all day, and then we come back. We have friends, and we can come back and do kirtan, have fun, like talk about Krishna, and then then we we go to bed. We're ready for the next day. So it's just perfect setting for doing our education, material education, and continuing our spiritual education. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me, hosting me. Are there any, any other? Yeah, few more? just a... I believe yeah. that, Ka yeah, we should end, but yeah. Kalakanta Prabhu, I think you're giving the Bhagavatam class tomorrow morning? Yes, Maharaj. So Krishna. every morning, quarter to eight, we have a class in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the ripened fruit of the entire Vedic tree. And Kalakanta Prabhu is also a very deep scholar. He'll be giving class tomorrow at quarter to eight here at the temple. And afterwards, we have a knockout breakfast. So what's not to love? We hope to see you tomorrow. Hari Bo. Hari Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Sri Radha Giridhari Ki Jai. Hari